Thank, thanks, Paul. So let's give a warm welcome to our guest, Heather. So today's talk is by Heather Clover. She currently works as a staff technical writer at Redockly. She was part of the 2021 Google Season of Talks program. Today, she will share her story of how she quickly established trust, built rapport with the Redockly's dev and product team, and leveraged her GSOT experience to become full-time employee of the organization. Without further ado, over to you, Heather. Okay. I'll stop sharing now. And I will now share my screen. And um, when does, oh wait, hang on, sorry. Hi, thanks for having me. Uh, I am excited to be here to talk about Google Season of Docs, which was a great program and experience for me. Um, I'm, glad, I'm glad to see so many people interested in participating, um, and hopefully I can help you all to do so. So first, I'd like to give a little bit about myself. Um, this is the first talk I have given to a group of adults outside of work. But in a previous career, I regularly presented to teenagers. I was a high school English teacher for nine years, mostly teaching 14 and 15 year olds. Hopefully y'all will be a better audience. I have been in software technical writing field for about 10 years and writing documentation as code for about six. Uh, some of that time I worked with Madcap Flare uh, and the remainder of the time I worked with static site generator tools like Antora and Jekyll. Throughout my time as a software technical writer, I've written about various subjects in the field, including encryption, uh, database migration, DevOps, YAML configuration, APIs, API gateways, and DAST, which is dynamic application security testing. Uh, my interests include cats, knitting, reading, yoga, hiking, and tea. Um, I've included a picture of me and my family. We were at the Grand Canyon where we did a lot of hiking, which my kids did not enjoy, but we did. Um, and three, my three cats, which are Artemis, Leia, and Ben. And then a scarf that I actually knitted for my sister two years ago. So in 2021, I participated in the Google season of Docs, writing documentation for Redoc, which is an open source product of a company called Redocly. Redockly is a software company that was created to solve a specific problem. The CEO of Rebilly, Adam Altman, was not happy with the options he had for publishing his API documentation. So he had his team make his own product and they called it Redoc, Rebilly's documentation. Afterwards, they open sourced the product and it was so popular and they kept getting so many requests for enhancements, they decided to expand. And now Redockly creates multiple products, including an enhanced version of Redock that includes try it functionality in a developer portal and a workflow tool that automates the process of generating and updating developer and API reference documentation. Redockly has another open source tool that was also included in Google Season of Docs, um, the Redoc CL, Redockly CLI, uh, but a different writer was assigned to that product. So how did it all happen? Uh, to go back probably too far, in 2019, I remember reading about Google Season of Docs for the first time. I follow Sarah Maddox, a technical writer at Google, and she wrote an article about how she had started this program to help enhance the documentation of open source projects and to give technical writers the opportunity to participate in the open source community. I was thrilled. I had always wanted to get involved in open source and I'd heard about Google's Summer of Code and thought it was an awesome opportunity, but I couldn't participate since I'm not a developer. But this program I could participate in. However, when I read through some of the projects looking for help, I was intimidated by how technical they were and had never felt confident enough to apply. Also, with work and two kids, I wasn't sure I had the time. However, in 2021, I saw that Redoc was one of the participants. I had worked with Redoc before while taking Tom Johnson's API documentation course and had really loved the product. 
I thought it would be a great project to work with, but again, I was hesitant because of time, so I didn't actually apply. A short while later, Swatmull, who's a technical writer ad at the time, was a technical writer advocate at Redockly, was on the Write the Docs Slack requesting help with the project because one of the writers they had selected was unable to continue for personal reasons. I couldn't resist. I messaged him that I would be interested in the project, figuring he'd already gotten many offers, but couldn't hurt to try. He responded shortly after that he was interested and would like to review my portfolio. I sent him a link to my portfolio, which I had kept up to date with my most recent accomplishments. And not long afterwards, he asked for a meeting. I met with him and Ivana, the other technical writer on the team, and discussed the project and the expectations they had. I was clear on how much time I could devote to the project, what I knew and didn't know, and my level of experience with the products. The meeting went well, and soon after, they asked me to join the project. I truly believe my success was mostly due to my abilities in Git, GitHub, and working with Markdown, and my portfolio, which demonstrated these abilities, as well as my writing skills. I cannot overly recommend a good portfolio site, as well as experience with Git and GitHub, if you are interested in joining Google Season of Docs. As a matter of fact, Swatmull is giving a workshop on building an online portfolio using static site generators at the STC in Atlanta in May. And I've included a link in the comments of my slides. And if you're interested in seeing the slides, they're on my portfolio site, which I'll provide the link when we go through questions. So now to how it went. Once we both agreed I would be a good fit for the project, I needed to establish communication channels with the team, learn more about the project, and get started writing. One of the first and most important things we needed to set up on my joining the project was a way for me to communicate with the team. So I set up multiple ways to communicate with them, synchronously and asynchronously. Because of time differences, setting up synchronous communication became a bit of a challenge. Ivana was living in Croatia, Swapnel lived in Australia, and I was in the U.S. on the East Coast. Furthermore, I had a full-time job and often could not meet during work hours. However, we were all flexible and therefore able to find a time. It was very late for Swapnel and early for me, so we only met bi-weekly, but the meetings were worthwhile for me to stay connected to the team. While these Zoom meetings were helpful for keeping me connected, I needed a more immediate and asynchronous way to ask questions and get feedback. So the team added me to a Google Season of Docs specific Slack channel in Redockly Slack. Ivana, Swapnel, Adam, and a couple of the developers were in the channel, so I could ask technical as well as writing questions when needed. It was also where I could update everyone on my progress and post PR links for review. We'll get to PRs later. Additionally, I used GitHub, a GitHub project to keep a record of what I was doing and link to it in the channel. GitHub projects has a nice scrum board option where you can create cards that you can move into different status lanes and easily link to PRs and issues in GitHub. I used this GitHub project to summarize my accomplishments after the project ended, so it really came in handy. Once I had established communication channels, I needed a, to get a better understanding of the project and the product I was going to document. Having started Google Season of Docs late, I felt pressure to get something written quickly, but I am glad I decided it was worthwhile to take the time to learn the products better. I put a couple of tasks on my board to use pro the products in different ways and read through the documentation, informing the team that was what I was working on initially. It helped me to understand the issues users may have been running into, and it gave me a better understanding of the workflow of using the product. I also was able to ask technical questions while doing this in the Slack channel to hone my understanding even more. Finally, it was time to start getting right, to start left. It was time to get started writing. Once I was ready to contribute, I forked the repo where my content would live. Forking a repo is creating a copy of the project in your GitHub account. It is common practice to fork a repo when contributing to open source projects because the project maintainers limit who has right access to the repo for obvious reasons. Making a contribution usually requires a pull request or a PR 
where you are requesting that they merge your changes into the main repo. After I forked the project, I cloned or copied my forked version of the repo to my local computer. Once I had a copy on my local computer, I could create branches in Git and start editing the files. Some teams will have standards for how they name branches, so you will want to check with them in advance. Once I was ready for my edits to be reviewed, I would open a pull request to merge my updates into the main branch of the original repo. A pull request compares your changes to what's currently in the repo and allows the team to review any updates. Teams can then make comments on specific changes by line in the files and either approve the pull request or request edits. After the team reviewed my PRs, I would respond to any comments and make edits that were needed. Once the team was happy with my updates, they would approve my PR and I could merge it into the main code. In the time that I was involved in Google Season of Docs, I was able to get four deployment guides written as well as a quick start for Redoc. I also organized, removed old content, and added new content to the Redoc README file that needed some love. It was very satisfying to see my updates published, especially when Adam informed me that my updates were making a difference based on his review of the Google Analytics from the site. Here are some of the important learnings I got from participating in Google Season of Docs. First, budget time for the project. One of the hardest things for me was devoting the time I needed to the project. I'm a working mother of two and my free time is limited. I would work all day writing for my job and then at night, when my kids were in bed, I would write for Redoc. I also would devote time on the weekends, which meant juggling the kids with my husband. This is something that must be considered when taking on a Google Season of Docs project. The Redoc team was counting on me to produce the documentation, and I needed to put the time in to get it done. Next, over-communicate. One of the things that really helped me to keep organized and my team informed of my progress was to over-communicate. I told my team everything I could on my progress. I asked as many questions as I could think of, and even sometimes included reminders on my PRs still waiting for reviews. Without good communication, it would have been very difficult for me to accomplish the things I was able to accomplish. Ask for a style guide. After I joined the team, one of the first things I asked for was a style guide, which Swapmill sent to me. It was very helpful for me to understand how my style would need to change from my employer's style to the reflect Redox style. Every company differs on writing style, and it helps save me time in PR reviews by knowing these things in advance. Companies will also usually have contributing guidelines, and it is worthwhile to review those as well. Mostly they refer to code contributions, but they may include branching, branch naming guidelines and tests that need to be run before you open a PR, like a link checker. Some examples of contrib great contributor guides are Dockers, Fedoras, Jenkins, Microsoft Learn, GitLab, Kong, Drupal, and Async APIs. I have included links in the slides for those uh, contributor guidelines if you want to take a look at another time. Ask questions. I asked a lot of questions about the product, how the team usually worked, who should review my content, what the user's experience was supposed to be, and more. Asking these questions really helped me to keep engaged and it helped the Redoc team to know that I was being thorough. I was intimidated at first because I didn't know them very well, but I knew if I didn't ask, it would be worse than if I did and it was a seemingly dumb question. Luckily, the team was very supportive and were never too busy to answer my questions and were always happy to help me learn. Most open source pro projects will be this way. No Git and GitHub. My knowledge of Git and GitHub helped tremendously because I was able to work with a team in the ma manner in which they were used to working. It is very common practice for open source projects to use GitHub and to use Git. So if you understand those things, it's easy, easy to involve yourself. I cannot overly encourage learning Git and GitHub. Choose a project with interesting tech. It motivated me a lot. Um, that I really liked working with and had a great interest in the project and the company. Um, 
it pushed me through times when I really w- was tired and didn't feel like writing um, and I needed to get the work done. Have an up-to-date portfolio site. It's easy to let your portfolio get stale, but since this opportunity came up so quickly, if I hadn't been keeping it up to date, I wouldn't have had time to update it, update it and it may not have, I may not have been selected. It's very important when you accomplish something new that you're proud of that you go ahead and update your portfolio. And then finally, be clear about what you do and do not know. I was very clear with them from the beginning, my level of expertise with the product, their tool set, and what I was willing to learn. This set expectations well, and they knew going in what kind of help and support I would need. So how's it going now? Well, Redoc now has a pretty full doc set that it did not have before and an updated readme. I have several more writing samples I have added to my portfolio, as well as more experience with Redoc, which is a tool that is commonly used in my field. And most importantly, I now happily work full-time for Redocly. When I was recently open to new opportunities, I saw they were hiring. Having worked with the team, knowing it was a good supportive environment, I contacted Adam, whom I had chatted with during the project, and asked if he was still looking for a technical writer. Luckily, he was and was happy to discuss it with me. Because he had already worked with me in the past, he was familiar with my skills and how I work, so it was a fairly easy interview process. Thanks for having me. I'm open to questions, but before I open the floor, I wanted to go over one thing I did not include in my uh, slides, and that is um, one of the things that first surprised me about working in open source is the level of differences in the communities. So for instance, when I worked at CloudBees, which is an enterprise version of Jenkins, which is an open source project, a big one, um, it was a much more involved process to make edits and contribute. Uh, The community was large, super involved, and very opinionated about any updates. It could take a while before you got something approved, which could be really frustrating for contributors. But then there are some open source projects that are looking to build a community and don't really have a lot of community involvement. So for instance, when I worked at Kong, they were trying to get their community more involved because contributions had really dropped off. What was happening for the documentation side was a community member would make a contribution, but they would do it in such a way that we couldn't merge it, merge it right away because it didn't follow our standards. So for instance, we had our project set up where if you made it an update, you needed to do it in all the different versions separately. And sometimes they would just make the update on a single file. Uh, a writer on our team decided uh, to contribute a contribute or to create a contribution guide. So users would be aware of our standards in advance. And we all worked together to publish our style guide publicly to make contr- contributing more approachable. A lot of open source projects will have contributions, a contributions markdown file and the project repo. Some of them are really involved and others are pretty basic. It's important to understand their standards before you try to make a contribution, otherwise you'll be wasting a lot of time later. If an open source project doesn't have a contributions guide or isn't very thorough, you could offer to create or expand it. It's definitely a worthwhile thing to do if they're hoping to get contributions, which most open source projects need greatly. And that is all that I wanted to add to that. If there are any questions, I am now ready to answer them. Oh, it's fell on. Where would the oh. questions be? Are they in? Oh, they're in the chat. Oh, uh, anybody has any questions? So I have. Some of the other things I could go through, some of the other things that are commonly asked about Google season of docs um, is uh, how to choose an open source organization from the list. Um, What I would look for is, again, I would check out the community and see uh, and see how they interact with other people that are looking to make contributions. You can look, you can actually go into the GitHub project and look and see how many issues they have open. Um, If there's a lot, chances are it could be a while before yours gets merged. Um, 
Or, you know, it could be that those are just stale and they haven't had an opportunity to take a look at them. Um, another thing is the contributions guide. If they have a really thorough one that they've really thought through, like how they want you to contribute, that can be helpful. And if they haven't thought it through, that can really create stumbling blocks. So Heather, so do you have any, um, as a technical writer myself, it, it's not easy to get the responses from the developers. So do you have any tips or tricks to uh, interact with the developers? Sure. Um, if I'm struggling to get uh, feedback, um, mm -hmm. I try to make it as specific as possible. I find sometimes if if I'm too vague or if I don't, and if I, and I also try to figure it out on my own. And if I show them that I have, like I'll say, hey, I've done this and I've done this, but I still haven't been able to figure this out. That kind of okay. shows that it's not like, like I'm actually making an effort on my end and they tend to expect that. Um, so those are the kind of the ways if I'll try to do it myself, I'll tell them how I've tried and I'll be as specific as possible. Um, and that okay. can be, yeah, but it's, it's helpful. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. And um, and another another issue with the uh, open source projects that I've had is, uh, is having people getting people to review your PRs. It doesn't happen very easily. So I think you really have to build your patience and um, yeah. Otherwise, it's it's pretty hard sometimes. So. I, you said it was great in Redockly, right? I mean, you have any... Yeah, the good thing about Redockly was, well, first, they, since they were doing Google Season of Docs, they knew I was going to be contributing. And so that kind of helps. Okay. If you're involved yes. in the program, like, they know. Like, and they want your stuff. Obviously, they wouldn't have tried. They wouldn't have created a, you know, proposal otherwise, right? Um, yes. There were some instances still where I kind of had to, you know, do little reminders and, you know, and in, uh, in Slack. And I was, you know, you know, I was just kind of persistent with it. Like, hey, y'all, have you taken a look? <laughs> I made these edits, you know, because it, a lot of times you don't want to move forward until you know that step is good. Right. Um, and it can be tricky for them, too, because, right, they're still working full time while they're mm -hmm. doing this as well. So what you'll find is it may be that you have to wait a little longer, but with Google season of docs, at least, you know, that they're, they're expecting things. Um, and it's something you can also talk to whoever's running um, the program. If you're not getting your stuff from merch, you know, say something, like, Hey, I, I signed up so that I can publish and stuff. And if, you know, is there a problem? Like what's going on? You know, again, the over communication is pretty key there. Uh, so Pavit, do you have any questions in the chat? Do you want to check? Yeah. Yep, I don't have any questions. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, Anshita, I think she wants to know if you require any coding knowledge uh, to work in developer documentation. So I guess it depends on the project and they'll usually like tell you what they're expecting, you know, like some of them, maybe they might want you to know some stuff. Like I know some of them are, you know, like it's developer docs. And so they want you to like write a sample program with their stuff and then explain how you did that kind of thing. Um, I didn't have to with Redockly. I did know some things, right? Like I knew how to work with their project and I knew how to run it on my computer locally. But like, can I code? No, I cannot code. And again, that's where it's so key, like in the very beginning to be up front and say like, this mm -hmm. is what I know. This is what I don't know. And these okay. are the things I'm willing to learn. So, and some mm -hmm. of them will be willing to teach you stuff um, and take mm -hmm. you so far. Some of them don't want to be involved. And so they may not be interested. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, as a freelancer? Um, well, Write the Docs has a great Slack channel. Um, and I have found if you go there, I think there's a channel for that, for people looking yes. at this work. Yes. And if nothing else, you could ask in that channel, like, hey, I'm looking to freelance. And there are freelancers who are all over the place and write the docs that would be willing, I think, to help you out. And that's what I would do. 
yeah, to add on to what Heather said, I think there's also a community help wanted and open open source channel where uh, they frequently post uh, projects that require uh, contributions from writers. And, uh, well, in the Write the Docs Portland conference is coming up. And sometimes they'll have people on writing day that are looking for writers that you can join. Um, and then you kind of can establish that relationship and then maybe later you could do freelance. If I'm moving in finance, oh, okay, someone wants to ask, if I'm moving in a finance domain and I'll have to move and have to move in developer documentation, I mean, that's more tech oriented. Is that really gonna be difficult? to move from finance domain to technical documentation. Um so you're so you're currently in finance and you're looking to go into tech docs. Um you'll want to learn kind of the tool set and write the docs has a lot of great uh, resources for that. And like I said like Swapmill's giving a talk like there's different places like you'll want to learn the tool sets and the way to find that out is if there's a company you're interested in you can go to their GitHub repo and see what they use to publish their docs. And then kind of like, if it's like Jekyll, for instance, you can kind of look, look up stuff on Jekyll. Tom Johnson has a great explanation for Jekyll actually that I used to teach myself Jekyll. Um, and it also helped a little bit with um, just using SSGs in general was going through and using his, he's created a, it's a template, uh, a Jekyll template. And it's really quite good. That's but what you'll find is, as far as finance, if you have a background in finance, there might be organizations in finance that are looking for that expertise, and you can use that to your advantage. And that sometimes can be more valuable. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, the fintech industry, where you already have the domain knowledge, you just have to learn a few technical skills to work there, yeah? Absolutely. And they're all doable. I mean, it's nothing yes. to, yeah. True. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Mansi wants to ask, can you share some information around the timelines involved while working on an open source project? For, for Google Season of Docs, they have a site. Um, and they walk, there's a whole page just dedicated to the timelines. And I think it's May is when writers can start, you know, getting involved. But like, even before that, like right now, I think they're finalizing the organizations for this year. Um, and then after that's done, like sometimes you can just contact, from what I understand at this point, you can just contact the organization directly. And if you look in the Slack for Write the Docs, I keep bringing this up. <laughs> um, some organizations have already gone into that Slack channel and said, hey, we're thinking about doing Google Season of the Docs. If you're interested, check out these links. Um, and so you can reach out to them directly. For other projects, I mean, it all depends on the organization and, and what you're looking into. Like, there's a lot of projects that are always accepting contributions. And so there's no set timeline. You just contact them and say, hey, I'd like to contribute. Do you have any good first issues? Um, do you have anything specific to docs that you need help with? Um, I'm, I'm not sure, Mansi, if she's asking about timelines for Google Season of Docs or in general for an open source project, yeah. Um, uh, but but as you said, I think uh, I think reaching out via Slack. Most of the open source projects have Slack, GitHub. So I think reaching out to them and asking if they need any help is must be the right uh, thing to do. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So. Uh, so how long was your project? Because I remember in Google Season of Docs, there are some projects which extend for like six months, six to eight months, and some get it done by three months. So uh, were you able to finish your project in three months or? Yeah, I, I wrapped up in three months. It wasn't uh -huh. a, whole, a whole lot. There were some things I didn't quite get to, but I kind of I mean, I had to end it at that point. Mm -hmm. I think um, it could have been extended and there's definitely more that can be done there. And I think they might want to do Google Season of Docs again. Um, okay. Yeah, like I think Swapnel, when he did Google Season of Docs, his ended up extending. He did quite a bit. Um, but I mean, it all depends on the project. So yeah, I mean, okay. extended. I 
think the best part of Google Season of Talks is kind of helping the writers get involved in the project even after the program ended. So I think that's what you did, right? So you got a full time and yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, I mean, it's nice. Like the idea of open source is great because it's it's out there for anyone to use. And then mm -hmm. when you, you're now part of that, you know, and, and I, like I said, I always wanted to contribute, but I always felt kind of like, I don't know that I have what I need. But what you'll find is when you talk to some of these organizations, you don't need as much as you think you do, you know? And if you just have like a basic grasp of certain things, sometimes they're willing to walk you through the rest. I mean, they need contributions, so. Absolutely, yeah. And nothing like open source to build your portfolio, yeah. Great. Especially if you're a freelancer, yes. Sure, because it's, it's out there, you can link to it freely, whereas- Absolutely, like, yes employer that you can't link to right and if that's the case you're stuck but this way you have it like it's out there like my stuff I did for Redoc, it's out there it's published I can link absolutely to it. yeah yeah absolutely I, I can't agree more on that yeah uh, can you uh so Jasmine wants to ask can you share a little about your project what problem you were solving and which domain yeah, so Redoc, what we're, what Redoc is, is it's a way that you can publish API docs. So it's kind of like, if you've ever heard of like Swagger, mm -hmm. uh, Redoc basically takes an open API definition and it turns it into like documentation. It's, it's kind of magic, like it just, it's this three pane, you know, and it's got, you know, all the stuff you've written in your open API doc come, comes to life basically on the page. Um, but the problem was Redoc was super popular, but they didn't actually have any formal docs for it. I think at the time, all they had was README. Like that was it. Okay. And it was all kind of like crammed stuff in there that wasn't really very organized. And there was a lot of like questions and concerns, like people didn't know how to get started. So now um, if you go to the Redocly docs now, you'll see there is a Redoc section that actually has formal doc. Um, okay. that that is linked to from README, which makes the README a little bit easier to read. Read, okay. Really, a README is not a place for doc. Um, people will often shove stuff in there just because they don't know where else to put it, but it's it's too much. Like a README is just like, here's how to get started kind of thing, um, and information about the project, so. So, um, so most of this uh, API first companies, uh, they expect technical writers to have experience in API development or design or documentation. So uh, did, did you have a pre previous experience working in API documentation before you worked on Redocly? I did, not okay. much. I not had much. a little, like when I was at, when I was at Cloudbees, there was a, there was an API that was not well documented and I was kind of tasked with it. Mm -hmm. um, and what I did was I used Tom Johnson's um, free API doc course, um, mm -hmm. which he still has posted up there as far as I know. Um, and I used that to kind of come up with something that they still use right now. Um, and that's how I kind of got an understanding of APIs. Um, some places will require more of it. Others not. Like my experience was not particularly thorough, but like I said, I was clear from the beginning. I was like, this is what I've done. Like okay. <laughs> I have to walk me through some of this other stuff, you know? And they were like, that's okay. cool. That. Okay. Yeah. 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 Telling up front solves a lot of problems. Yes. <laughs> yes. And uh, yeah, I'm, I, I also, I contribute to a, a open source project, the Good Docs project, where we develop a lot of templates. So, uh, so I think if someone is new to technical documentation or someone is a developer, so no, they can just pick the templates from the Good Docs and start working on it. So yeah, I could provide the link in the chat, yes. That's a great project, yeah. Yeah. I was, I was thinking about contributing, I haven't yet, I need to. <laughs> <laughs> You can also contribute to write the docs. They, they have a website. And if there's information yes. you have to add to that, you can actually open a pull request on write the docs. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Can you get a link to Tom Johnson's resources? Yeah. It's uh, it's in my slides actually, okay. um, which is on my portfolio. So if you go to my portfolio and you click on projects, you should see write the docs. Um, 
write the Docs Talk slides, and then you can just click that link and it'll open it up in Google Docs. Or yeah, Google Sheets is what it's called. Yeah, I've linked to it. I think it's in the, like if you look down at the little comments at the bottom of the slide. I haven't shared the portfolio details as well, yeah. Um, well, else? that portfolio is, it's a pretty basic portfolio. I actually ended up using Hugo just because I wanted to. But honestly, if you wanted to go that route, because I'm using GitHub Pages, Jekyll's simpler because mm -hmm. with Jekyll, you can just, it just automatically will upload it to GitHub Pages. Hugo takes okay. a few extra steps. Um, and so that I went with it just for the challenge and I wanted to use Hugo. Um, but you don't need to use Hugo. I would recommend Jekyll if you're going to go that way. Okay. Yeah, even Write the Docs website, they have a separate section on uh, building portfolio, yeah. Yeah, actually, there was a guy who just wrote that, um, and he had posted the, the PR in the Slack channel to review. It was super cool. He just wrote that. Yes, yes. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, before you joined Redocly, were you working for a closed source organization or was it open source as well? The last organization I worked for was closed. Um, closed. I'm trying to think. The only, the open source communities I've worked for, I worked for Cloudbees, which had a Jenkins Okay. Connection, but I mostly wrote the closed docs for the enterprise version. Um, mm -hmm. Then there's, well, actually their docs are open. It's the code that's closed. That's right. Um, okay. For, okay, the docs are open. Okay. I know for that. Kong, that one was open source. Okay. Uh, or it had an open source component. And I wrote docs for kind of both. Um, okay. And then for, I'm trying to think, for MuleSoft, I think no, that was closed. MuleSoft was closed, but I believe their docs are open and you can make contributions to MuleSoft's docs. Um, they don't have a style guide posted. The style guide is unfortunately on their confluence. Um, mm -hmm. So to you'd have to ask or you just open a contribution and hope that you met their standards, I guess. Um, trying to think, that's it. Yeah, I don't, have, I don't have a whole lot of experience in open source. I, I probably... I'd like to get more, but that's like six to have it. Yeah, a lot of people ask me how. What is the difference between working for, between working in in a closed source and an open source organization? So, uh, do you want to share anything? Sure. You have your, your sure. Thoughts? What's nice, What's nice about open source is often the docs are open, which means the repo is accessible by anyone, which is nice because. You know, if you want contributions or you want to share stuff, like it's just there, you know, um, and anybody can see it and anybody can open a PR. Now, there are, like I said, guidelines for how that PR is merged, if it is merged, but at least it's out there. Um, also, with closed, um, they're kind of particular about like what you tell people um, and what can be published. Um, it's easier to share your work if it's open source. Um, sometimes with open source, when you're making a contribution, you have to sign some kind of, there's like a little um, agreement that you have to sign um, to make sure that you're okay with giving your stuff to an open source community. Um, whereas you don't see that much with closed source. Yeah. With open source, you can actually accept contributions outside of the team. So like you might be a writer on the team and then you'll be reviewing other people's edits Correct. Yes. Yes. and communicating with them, which can be nice, especially if you're like the only writer on a team, which happens in a lot of these communities. So you can get help from other people like, hey, I noticed this you know, command is wrong. You know, I'll fix it. And then you can update the docs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, another thing that I noticed is uh, in open source, it's very easy to reach out to the users. Like I worked in a project where we had a user who just attend, who decided to attend a meeting and 
he started listing all the issues that he had with the documentation. And I was like, wow, it doesn't ha never happens in closed source. Very difficult to reach the end users. It's true. You do get a lot more pain need and a lot more involvement um, with open source, which is nice. Um, it is hard with closed. Yeah, because you're just like speaking into a void sometimes. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, pretty much we've had a very good conversation and pretty much covered all aspects of uh, working in an open source project. There was one other project I wanted to mention and I didn't is um, that I know they're pretty open to contributions to their docs and it is Airbyte. Airbyte, okay. Yeah, um, I know this because I follow the technical writer that leads the team. Uh, her name is Amruta, um, mm -hmm. and she has a channel where she talks about tech writing. It's great. She's on YouTube, uh, but she definitely accepts um, docs um, requests or docs PRs, and I think mm -hmm. she has a pretty decent contribution guide. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, wait, probably I could share the link. Um... Yeah, it's Airbyte. They have. They, I think they have an open source. And then, yeah, they have a bit count, I think. Yeah, bit count, yes. Yeah, um, Amrita Ranade, she has a very awesome YouTube channel, yeah. Right? <clears throat> yeah, let's see. Anybody else? Um, anybody else wants to unmute themselves and have a conversation with Heather or Clark for any get having have any questions answered? Pretty much covered everything. Yeah. There's a lot of resources out there for Git and GitHub too. Um, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, has a lot of free like courses that'll actually walk you through using them um, and their product. If you go and you look at their GitHub, uh, look at through GitHub's projects, um, you can see that. Like, I think there's one where it's like hands-on and it's like you actually clone the, or you fork the repo in your project and it mm -hmm. walks you through um, making a pull request and that sort of thing. Something to look into. Yeah, I think, yes. Uh, as you rightly said, I think without the basic knowledge of GitHub and uh, get it it does get difficult, uh, but I think I think it can be quite intimidating to just learn the entire Git sometimes. So I think what I did was you not know, just learn the first few basic commands like you like what you listed, for cloning, creating a branch, committing, adding, and then pushing it, pushing it, pulling it. So yeah. So about like four or five set, four or five commands, just get that right. And then you could slowly build your knowledge on Git. Yeah. So it's but it's not too bad. bad. It is definitely not too bad. Yeah. Yeah, that's all I've got. And um, there's tons of stuff I don't use. Like there's tons of stuff like like cherry picking. I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There are tons of things that you can do with Git, but I think to just start off, you just get yourselves comfortable with these uh, few commands and workflows. And uh, what we do in um, the Good Dogs uh, is sometimes uh, we have a lot of contributors who are very new to Git, technical writers who are new to Git. So we kind of, we initially we work on Google Docs. Uh, just it, it just makes the collaboration easier and the uh, you remove it, they remove the onboarding friction and then and then slowly we have Git trainings uh, and then we slowly help the contributor, uh, make them more comfortable working in Git, yeah. So that's, that's yeah. <clears throat> but I don't know that that's not the case with all open source projects, like some projects are not comfortable collaborating in Google Docs, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the most of the ones I've worked with, it's all Git um, and GitHub. Yes, yes. There's also GitLab. I think that's where the good project the uh, docs project is, isn't it GitLab? Yes, uh, the, uh, we, we removed the good docs from GitHub to GitLab, yeah. 
And GitLab, instead of a PR, it's, a, it's an MR. Much, yes. Much request, yes. It's pretty much the same. It, it's pretty much the same, yeah. Yeah, I have yes. my portfolio in, in GitLab for a little while. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Pavan, I think you could stop the recording. Um, yeah, so uh, so thank you all for um, taking part in today's session. And thank you, Heather, for sharing your insights and learnings contributing to Redocly's documentation as part of the uh, Google Season of Docs program. And uh, yeah, I think one I, I had a lot of takeaways, but my biggest takeaway from today's talk is uh, learning how important it is to establish that good relationship with the engineering team to develop good documentation in open source. Uh, so participants, uh, whoever is applying to Google Season of Docs, wishing you lots of good luck and best wishes. Uh, if that is all, then we could wrap up.